Okay, so we're going to change gears a little bit. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Melinda Lawrence. Um, I'm an interventional pain physician, and I was asked today to talk about advances in interventional pain medicine. All right, so um, a lot of my practice is focused in on chronic low back pain. Um, this is some of the majority of the patients that we see and probably three novel, more novel interventional treatments that we have right now. We're gonna focus in on these things today. And uh, these are geared towards patients who have chronic low back pain and people who are typically not surgical candidates, um, at least not in my practice. Uh, and so those interventions are vasovertebral vertebral nerve ablation, which is targeting vertebrogenic pain, um, something called Reactivate, which is a neurostimulation device that activates multifidus muscles, and something called closed loop stimulation, which is a novel uh, spinal cord stimulation therapy. So first gonna start by talking about vasovertebral vertebral nerve ablation. Um, so a large portion of my practice is spent doing epidural injections, which primarily treat inflammation and disc related pain. Um, and a large number of my patients do respond to this type of treatment. However, over time, we may not see the same relief and it may not be as meaningful as we are looking for. Um, a lot of these patients also fall, in a, fall into a category where, you know, they aren't having true surgical lesions. And not only do we see changes in their disc, but also in the adjacent bone. Um, so there's been a shift in some of the thinking that, you know, the pain generator may not be just the disc, but actually the vertebral implants. What we know from research is that normal implants have nociceptors, um, but also those nociceptors are increased in damaged implants. There's higher innervation via the vasovertebral nerve, and um, there's more neo innervation in the actual implants as opposed to you know, annular tears uh, or disc degeneration, which we have traditionally thought as being a pain generator. There can be up to two times as much nerve density in those areas. So basically in patients who have these end plate defects, um, there's a pro-inflammatory state um, and it allows disc tissue to leak into the bone marrow and it incites an inflammatory response. This is something that we commonly see on uh, imaging like an MRI, which are called modic changes and those areas have increased nociceptor density. Um, in terms of anatomy of the vasovertebral nerve, we know from uh, immunohistochemical assays that pain nociceptors are at the vertebral end plates, and these trace back to the vasovertebral nerve, which is uh, where the focus of the procedure I'm gonna be talking about uh, targets. Uh, and we can see those on MRI actually, and the arrows, the red arrow points over to the MRI where the vasovertebral nerve is located in the lumbar spine. Uh, in terms of what we know also from the literature is that one imaging biomarker that does associate with pain are modic changes. These are bone marrow lesions or changes in the vertebral end plates that can be seen as signal intensity changes on T1 and T2 weighted imaging. Um, there's a growing consensus that these changes are very specific, highly specific for uh, low back pain. So people who have these changes are likely to have a, a painful disc in between these changes, whereas uh, they have low sensitivity. So the absence of these changes might not be that great at ruling out pain at that level. But typically this is what we're looking for if we're considering a patient for basi vertebral nerve ablation, either type one or type two changes. If they have type three changes, they would not be a candidate for this therapy. And this is kind of a summary, summary of the study showing um, that there's a high specificity of modic changes and chronic low back pain, whereas the sensitivity is more low and variable. So what is the procedure? Uh, this procedure is something that we do in interventional pain, and uh, we access the pedicle with the trocar. We create a channel. We use a special type of um, stylet, which is made out of nitinol, which is something that heats up as it goes into the patient and it stiffens. And so we're able to make that curve once we introduce it through the trocar. Uh, we get that radio frequency probe in place, and then we ablate the basi vertebral nerve. Uh, it's typically ablated for 15 minutes at each level. Um, and this is on label to, to be used from L3 down through the, the tailbone at S1. So these are a couple of my patients. Um, they're actually all uh, both followed. So they're the two 
on the left are the T1 and T2 weighted. Um, for a patient of mine who is a 44-year-old guy, he actually herniated his disc um, doing CrossFit. He's extremely fit, very active person, runner. Um, and we had been seeing each other for several years. And so a lot of my patients who, when we started this um, procedure, came through my, my own population of patients. I've been treating them with epidurals, injections. You know, they've been doing physical therapy, taking medications uh, and getting some relief, but maybe not the relief they were looking for. When this procedure came along, I offered it to this patient. Uh, we did the L5 and S1 levels for these modic type one changes. And he was able to achieve 75% relief of his pain, which is sustained. And he returned to doing all of his normal stuff. So, you know, getting back to CrossFit, running um, the patient on the right uh, is a patient, again, who I had seen a long term. Um, she has she's not really a great candidate. Obviously, you can see she's morbidly obese. She has a lot of um, posterior fat. She has multiple comorbidities. Uh, but this is an outpatient can be done under monitored MAC anesthesia sedation and local. Um, and we did this procedure for her at the L4 and five levels. Um, she had 100% relief of her pain and is now involved in physical therapy to help strengthen the core and, and lose weight, you know, so um, really great response to, to that procedure. Um, this is pictures just from the case of the, the first patient that I showed on the left, the MRI, but, you know, so we access using um, these uh, cannulas and basically putting a radio frequency probe. Uh, you can see the AP and lateral views, uh, the final placement of the radio frequency probe to ablate the, the nerve. Um, in terms of data, because it's always good to have data for these new procedures, but there are two randomized controlled trials, one five-year data study, um, and there's some real world data as well. Um, basically it shows, uh, to, looked at patients who are between 25 and 70, I think in my practice, most patients are on the younger side um, because as they get older, there are going to be a lot of other changes that may not be amenable to just focusing in on modic changes. Uh, all these patients, for all the therapies I talk about today, we're looking at chronic low back pain patients. So this is not a first line therapy. This is after they've done things for at least six months, but most patients who were involved in the study had been doing things for at least several years. Um, and again, treating just type one and type two changes. This study had 255 patients. They put 147 in the treatment group and the other actually in the sham group, 78 patients. Um, and in terms of uh, Oswald Street Disability Index, decreased mean scores from 42 down to 22. Most of the relief that we see, whether it's change in pain score or disability, happens in the first three months. A lot of patients, as soon as we do the procedure, other than the procedural pain, um, obviously they have a large trocar in their back, you know, we're accessing the spine. But beyond that, most people get, a lot of people get immediate relief. Some people, it does take up to three months to see the full effect of the procedure. And beyond that, we know that it sort of plateaus. Um, in terms of VAS improvement, you know, statistically significant reduction in VAS scores, two thirds of the patient had 50% improvement in pain. We say, you know, for any procedure that we're doing, that's a major procedure in intervention, 50% would be good. You know, in studies, they typically take 30%. A patient would say 30% improvement would be good to them, but these are pretty amazing uh, improvements and half had more than 75% of relief of pain at five years and, and a third of patients were pain-free at five years. So, um, other important things. Uh, so a lot of these patients, uh, you know, might take opioid. There's significant reduction in opioid use at five years. And this even captures people who only take like one pill a week, you know, so it's really even people who take it sparingly, a lot of people decreased use. And then these people were patients who before used to get really regular injections. So, um, a lot of patients, and they include at baseline, was anybody who got any sort of spine injection in the past 12 months before they went into the study. And so that was a high number of patients, whereas, you know, only 4% then had it, any sort of intervention within that five-year period. So it's pretty mar remarkable. Uh, in terms of safety, you know, it's a pretty safe procedure. Um, there was one device procedure related event where somebody who is osteopenic had a vertebral compression fracture, but that potentially could be anytime you access or get into the spine. So that's kind of a summary of bad vertebral nerve ablation. Uh, there's something else here called reactivate. We will discuss, this is a neurostimulation device. It essentially targets the supporting muscles of the spine. The goal with this therapy is to restore function and in turn uh, alleviate chronic low back pain. Uh, there was an international multi-center study which was uh, started in 2014 we started enrolling. And then in 2016, we started implanting patients. Uh, that was the first year that they did that. We personally, in our practice, implanted patients from 2016 to 2018 with this therapy. 
in the Reactive 8B study. Um, and with that data, this is ultimately FDA approved. It was approved last year and it's commercialized and was available as of second quarter. So we are currently implanting patients in the UH system with this, but also uh, we have a, a second part of the study going actively recruiting. So important thing with this is that, especially in this you know, setting is to, to help patients rehab. This is something that again, treats chronic low back pain and restores function. Typically in patients who have chronic back pain, there's some sort of injury and they get spine, spine joint or tissue overload. There becomes pain, they get multifidus muscle inhibition. And then ultimately there's a functional uh, spine and joint instability and kind of like they're in this vicious cycle and, and they, they don't get better. Um, whereas most of our pain treatments, epidural injections, medications, we're just trying to focus in on treating the pain. This therapy is focusing at improving and restoring function and really focusing in on the small muscles around the spine. So the procedure itself, what is it? Um, we put two leads, four, four contact leads that essentially are placed just adjacent to the L2 medial branches of the dorsal rami, and they elicit uh, repetitive multifidus muscle contraction. They're small tines. So at the end of the distal electrode that essentially um, deploy and they capture into the muscles, um, specifically the intertransversary muscles, which are basically small muscles uh, found between the contiguous transverse processes of the vertebra. Um, this technique is something that's very similar. We do a lot of implants for neuromodulation in our practice. Uh, I, I think it has some advantages that, you know, it's not in the spine, it's completely reversible. Uh, it's not disruptive to any nerves or change any structures. Um, in terms of what happens for the patient, how does this work? It's not something that's on all day, but actually two times a day for 30 minutes, they lie down and they turn this device on and it activates the muscles to help restore the function. Um, in terms of uh, who is a candidate, people who, that are eligible for this type of intervention. So th this is purely for people who are not, have no surgical lesion. You know, every patient who's involved in the study, every patient who gets this device has no surgical lesion of any type, but things that we look for would be um, basically, they have to have some sort of evidence of multifidus malfunction or dysfunction. And that can be, you know, based on MRI grading, every patient has to have an MRI. Um, they have to have some degree of infiltration of fat into the multifidus muscles. This is something that is known to correlate with ongoing and chronic low back pain. And then uh, typically they have to have at least one physiologic test, which shows that they have dysfunction. So, you know, this bottom for everybody in this study, they had to have a prone instability test. The patients on their stomach with their legs, you know, off the bed, feet on the ground, um, and essentially the examiner pushes down uh, on the science process looking for painful areas. Uh, and when they find that spot, they have the patient lift their legs up off the ground. And if activation of those small muscles in the spine with the lifting of their legs resolves the pain, then that would be a patient who had a positive prone instability test and may benefit from a device that activates those muscles and helps to strengthen them. Those would be patients who would be considered to be in this study and be good candidates. Uh, in terms of who was actually in the study, um, you know, the Reactivate B, which we were part of in this center uh, and collected patients from two, 2016 to 2018, usually it's young people, you know, again, they can't have a surgical lesion. They've had longstanding back pain and all of the patients in this study had rather severe disability measured by ODI and also severe back pain as measured by VAS. Again, you know, all these patients had independent review of their MRI by spine surgeons and were deemed not to have a surgical, can uh, surgical lesion. So just quickly to go through the data, over half of these patients were considered remitters, which means that they went from a, down to a VAS of less than 2.5, no, remembering, recalling that their baseline average was 7.3, so that was a significant reduction. Um, Two-thirds had a VAS change of more than 50%, which we would say is you know, definitely a helpful pain therapy. Um, over half had more than 20 point a change in ODI, and two-thirds of those had a change in ODI of more than 50%, so less disabled. Um, the focus on this slide is just looking at the fact that people who were on opioids did re reduce or eliminate their intake voluntarily due to this new pain therapy. So the last thing I want to talk about um, is something called closed loop stimulation. Uh, a lot of my practice is an interest in, you know, pain, interventional pain is uh, spinal cord stimulation. 
Uh, maybe some of you in the audience have, you know, experience or familiarity with this device, uh, but the, for people who aren't aware of it, basically it is an, a battery or a pulse generator that hooks up to wires or electrodes, we call them leads, and these leads or wires go into the posterior epidural space. Um, they're surgically in, implanted into the spine, and uh, basically they stimulate the dorsal columns of the spinal cord to help alleviate pain, essentially. Um, in terms of innovation in spinal cord stimulation, um, since it was first pioneered and implanted by uh, neurosurgeon Norm Shealy here in Cleveland, actually in the 1960s, there's been a lot of innovation and interest in spinal cord stimulation. And a lot of that is looking at finding different types of stimulation, um, improving the devices, uh, looking at novel ways to change the standard settings, including the pulse width, amplitude, frequency, how we deliver energy essentially to the spinal cord. We now have many options for devices which are MRI compatible, which used to be something that was difficult uh, for patients in the past. Leads that can cover larger areas. So we used to have just eight contact leads. Now we have 16 contact leads. We can put four wires in a patient instead of just two. So lots of different things to cover more, more areas in the, in the body. Um, and then also looking at new types of stimulation. You know, So it used to be that if a person had a spinal cord stimulator, sort of like a TENS unit, you feel the stimulation where the device is targeting. But now we have stimulation that is paresthesia free. It's a very high frequency and patients feel nothing, you know? So uh, a lot of people definitely like that. Um, we know that spinal cord stimulation is thought to work through gate control theory, essentially. You know, we're activating non-painful fibers that's sending signals to our brain um, and kind of overriding any kind of pain signal. Uh, but many of the mechanisms for spinal cord stimulation, even though it's been around for such a long time, uh, we actually don't know a lot of the mechanisms of how it works. One new therapy, which is called uh, closed loop, or this, uh, which works by uh, um, focusing in on evoked compound action potentials is actually the first time that we have something that is a known and understood mechanism of action. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in this space. All right. Um, so this slide basically is just, uh, unfortunately it has a video, but I don't think it's been going to work here. Um, but the spinal space essentially is a dynamic space. You know, it's constantly moving as we're breathing, we're sitting, lying down, all the coughing, sneezing, all those things can change the way uh, the spinal space is affected. And closed loop stimulation works by um, measuring evoked compound action potentials. And then this can account, help account for the shifts in the spinal cord. So, you know, in medicine on the left side, we can see that this is uh, an action potential along a nerve. And then the graph on the right at the top in the blue is showing a schematic of what happens inside the cell. So we have intracellular depolarization and repolarization, um, opening of sodium channels, and then the sodium is going into the cell and then driving a positive charge. And then the pot potassium leaves the cell to repolarize. Um, on the bottom in the, the orange is basically the opposite of what's going on. So this is being measured extracellularly. And this is what is measured by the closed loop system. And it's the first kind of system for spinal cord stimulation to ever measure something specific. Um, so basically it's recording um, the response of the nerve fibers to, to a stimuli. And it's specifically, it's an ion measurement along the nerves, uh, at the, along the nerve axon, which occurs during an action potential, which generates an electrical field, which is then recorded. And so basically these E caps are a window into the activation of the dorsal column. And this gives us an objective measure of pain inhibition. So kind of factors, and, and the main thing from this slide is basically um, these E caps. So we have like a baseline, if we're doing nothing, it's kind of down here. And then as we, we cough, we lean back, we lean forward, we lie down. All of these different things are changing in our spine. One of the hard things with spinal cord stimulation is that usually there are fixed settings typically. And so if a patient moves, sometimes they might get a jolt, you know, all of a sudden they might get overstimulation and that leads the patient to turn down their device, which then they're now getting stimulation, but it's below any kind of stimulation that will be helpful. And then they don't use their device. And then we start taking the device out, you know, so this is, if we can account for these changes and not make it painful to the patient, uh, a lot of patients will be able to continue to use their device without issue. 
So this slide shows, you know, kind of in general how the closed loop system works. We have a stimulus, we capture these uh, ECAPs, it compares it to their normal prescription of stimulation that we've prescribed, and then it calculates a new current. And so in people who have stimulation that they can feel, a lot of times there's 40 frequency. There's a setting that we put in terms of how often a um, pulse is delivered. That's called the frequency. And essentially every time that um, they have these adjustments, the ECAP reads and adjusts to the patient's movement. And this happens in a day. Let's say a patient has it at 40, which is a typical setting in spinal cord stimulation. It's adjusting their device 3.5 million times a day if it's at that setting, or if it's at 60, it's 5.2 million adjustments a day. So there's no, a patient has a device that they can hold and they can change their adjustments um, and move their stimulation up and down. But obviously nobody's doing that 3.5 million times a day or, you know, 5.2 million times a day. So it's a really cool thing and it can keep them utilizing their device. In terms of what we've seen in the studies, um, one, it's an interesting space because it's a proven mechanism of action. Um, patients spend a lot of time in their prescribed therapeutic window. So the settings that are made by the physician, um, it's a long-term sustained pain control. Uh, nearly nine out of 10 patients experience long-term pain relief and more than six out of 10 patients experience 80% relief across two years. Um, there's also new kind of uh, clinical standards for secondary outcomes in that Patients had significant and meaningful improvements in functional ability, quality of life, and sleep across both studies. Safety is similar to anything else that we implant in terms of spinal cord stimulation. But one of the major things in this, which is the, at the bottom of the slide, is that there were no explants due to loss of efficacy. So that's a major uh, change uh, in people who have spinal cord stimulation, loss of efficacy, because maybe they turn it down or it's sub, th sub threshold, uh, maybe 20 to 30% as high as that for explant rate. So that's, that's a big difference uh, in this two year data. Um, so, and then of people who are high responders to this type of stimulation therapy, which is over half of the participants participants in the study. Uh, and those were considered to be people who had more than 80% relief. Um, these people were likely to be minimally disabled um, and they had significant improvement in sleep, which is much further, much more than any other spinal cord stimulator study has shown. Um, and it's also approaching normal patient population. So people who are not chronic pain patients. Uh, so those are kind of the, some of the new things that we're doing here in, in pain medicine. Um, I think it's kind of interesting right now because this is, these are different therapies that help target a, a kind of a different kind of population, chronic low back pain that's axial is really difficult to treat oftentimes. So having these new targets, you know, targeting the end plates, targeting the muscles around the spine to help restore function. And then also um, maybe improvements in novel uh, spinal cord stimulation delivery. I think it's important. Obviously, whenever we have these new therapies, we, we don't have all the studies that come from non-industry. So, I mean, that's also something that's gonna have to be looked at further uh, and just see what the real world, world data is. That's it. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Sure. I haven't, no. Once, once you do the lesion, um, and like if we were to MRI or get repeat advanced imaging on a patient who had that procedure, there actually is like, a, it looks like a defect in that area, you know, so it does make a pretty large lesion um, over time that can like kind of go back, but it doesn't, we, we don't know out to five years and they have actually even longer term data, you know, through the, the company that's not all published yet, um, but it, it typically doesn't come back at that level, no. Nothing to repeat. Yeah. When you were discussing the reactivating device. Sure. Maybe on like frequency and intensity over that 30 minutes. Yeah. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Um, you know, it's not something that's, you know, so apparent to the patient. You know, it's a like low, you know, frequency uh, settings. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. All right, cool. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah.